Welcome back and thanks for staying with us. Let us convene the summit, our panel of esteemed guests here on the show. Joining us from Odessa is journalist Thomas Much. And from London is Orisia Lutsevich, head of the Ukraine Forum at Chatham House. And from our I-24 News studios, we are joined by playwright, screenwriter, teacher, and creative director Evgeny Kazachkov. Hello, all of you, and thank you very much for coming on the show and to get to our main question of the day are Russian forces beginning to make gains in the Donbas region in eastern Ukraine the question is how close is President Vladimir Putin to victory let's take a look is the war in Ukraine finally turning in Vladimir Putin's favor as the Russian army continues to grind forward in the Donbas region troops have entered the city of Severodonetsk. If Putin's military can capture Ukraine's industrial heartland, Ukraine's survival as a viable state is in question. A grim scenario that looks increasingly possible, but not inevitable, as Ukrainian troops continue to hold on with stiff resistance. The capture of the Donbass region is at the heart of Russia's invasion an unconditional priority in the words of the foreign minister Lavrov. But the war in Russia exceeds the boundaries of the battlefield itself, as economic sanctions are just as powerful weapons. To prevent Russia achieving a semblance of victory, the Western alliance supporting Ukraine needs to increase support for Kiev. So, could the West hold its nerve, accelerating armed shipments, which would allow Ukrainian troops to regain momentum? Will the financial squeeze on Putin continue to tighten? Or will the Western position soften? And can we trust Putin when he calls the Donbass region his endgame? The prospect of a prolonged war is horrifying. But how can we speculate its next steps when there are so many moving targets? How close is Putin to claiming victory? Right, so let's get to it. Our panelists again, Thomas Much, Orisia Lutsevich, and Evgeny Kazachkov. How close is President Vladimir Putin to victory, if at all? You know the rules. You have 30 seconds each for your opening statements. Thomas, you go first. Shoot. Okay, I will say that, because I have just come back from the Donbass region, in terms of taking over at least the Luhansk Oblast, he seems very, very close indeed. The troops in Severodonetsk and Lysychansk are under enormous pressure. However, looking at the wider picture, remember that at the very start of the war, we were talking about whether the Russian army would overrun Ukraine within three or four days. Now we're talking about whether they can take one mid-sized city in the east that is still strategically important, but it's certainly not an administrative, you know, important administrative center right. all across Ukraine in the course of 100 days. All right, Thomas, let's go now to Orisia. Well, Putin has been changing what victory means for him from complete control and incapacitation of Ukrainian state to simply now gaining ground in the territory of the east where he already had a base to what declaring also a target in the Black Sea and control of Odessa and extending the land bridge. I would say he will struggle to achieve that objective because what Ukraine achieves was Western assistance. So he's nowhere near. Right, let's uh, go now to Evgeny. Uh, well, I guess strategically and in long term, Putin cannot win this war. But uh, the question is what he can try to sell to Russian citizens as a victory. As Russia is a <clears throat> kind of a PR state, uh, this can be anything, because propaganda can sell Russian citizens almost anything now but uh, the problem is whether this victory uh, can overweight uh, the losses of uh, and the economical and social disaster that right. Russia is facing right so uh, you all brought up here the uh, fundamental question of what is victory and I ask uh, the gaining of territory potentially for Russia in the Donbass and Lugansk regions with some type of negotiated settlement is that a victory for Putin considering the financial hit the sanctions the damage to his military the Nordic countries joining NATO if he manages to gain some slightly significant portion of territory. Who wants to jump in? 
Well, I might jump in and uh, just uh, give my thoughts as that. We sometimes wonder whether Vladimir Putin is playing the long game and that he thinks that the Western nations over a period of years and years and years will not keep up this extreme economic pressure. They will eventually lift sanctions. They will have to do deals on oil and gas, but he will still retain the territories that he took in conquest. Now, whether that turns out to be the case depends on Western unity and a whole uh, set of other factors, and I can't prognosticate on that, but that is one possibility. Right. Orisia, um, diplomatically, is there a reasonable outcome for Putin here? Look, Russia is becoming a pariah state. This has been the reality unfolding on our ground where Russia and the current Russian leadership because becomes completely non-trustable and some somebody where it's not just for President Zelensky is difficult to negotiate, but also for the United States. And we see the arms supply and the land lease program to Ukrainian armed forces and economic support to Ukrainian state to do everything to ensure that Putin faces and this kind of land grab becomes too costly and the Russian leadership and Russian establishment and society understands that this imperial um, appetite is simply they cannot stomach and they're choking on Ukraine. Let's bring in Evgeny here. What do you make of uh, those comments by uh, Thomas saying that eventually the European countries might sort of lower their guard as far as sanctions of Russia, that Putin is kind of building on the fact that all this will kind of fade away eventually? Uh, from what I heard recently, uh, this is kind of uh, intentional disinformation uh, spread around the world. Uh, there is no such a thing as uh, doubts or uh, some uh, contradictions between uh, Western players in these questions. No one uh, is about to tolerate uh, this uh, Putin's aggression or lift sanctions. But uh, the fact that we are talking about it's kind of <laughs> shows that this uh, black PR and disinformation uh, might be efficient in some way. But I don't think it's based in some real facts. But it should be noted that the European countries are right now negotiating how those sanctions will look. There's some countries that might be affected more by the sanctions economically and some less, and that's causing disagreements. Um, Thomas, do you have anything to add here? Well, I would say that, for instance, there are particular countries that have been very, very firm on taking a line with Russia. The further east you go, the Poland, and the Poland and the Baltic states. But then you have countries like France and Germany, which, you know, Germany is still yet to supply any of its heavy weapons to uh, to Ukraine. That seems like a country that could very, very easily potentially be convinced to lift sanctions or to start opening up back channels to Russia within the future. So I don't quite agree with Evgeny that these Western nations are seeing everything in lockstep. Orisia, do you um, identify maybe any weak link here in the sort of Western alliance that has emerged against Russia? Well, we clearly have, I would say, two groups of countries. One that believe that we have to do everything for Putin's defeat, and some that believe, and you know, some uh, even expressed by President Macron in France that we should not humiliate Russia. I mean, to be honest, Russia humiliated itself on the battlefield, losing quarter of its uh, armed forces and enormous amount of tanks and armored vehicles. And also, Putin humiliated Russia by unleashing this unprovoked to war of his own choice. But I think Ukraine so far with its alliance, Eastern Europe, Baltic states, United States, United Kingdom manages in a way to keep the unity and to convince that freedom and democracy, yes, it costly and investing into Ukrainian armed forces and paying economic price, it's better than actually then defending uh, territory of their own countries from Russian aggression. Um, Evgeny, going back to the main question that we had here, how close is Vladimir Putin to victory? Is there any victory here for Putin that is anything other than a short-term victory? Is there any long-term victory that Putin can achieve here, do you think? Uh, I believe there is no long-term victory in this. And uh, most of all, uh, there are some rumors, and I tend to believe them, that Putin doesn't really uh, think long term. This might be his uh, 
last kiss or a death wish even uh, because there are some leaks from Mi6 and some other uh, information sources uh, saying that Putin mm, might be facing some serious uh, surgeon operation and he might not come back to a real policy and back to Kremlin after this so he might go to some kind of uh, some medical resort soon and I don't think he really thought about like long-term things he, he tried it was his last bet like maybe this would my, be my legacy I have nothing to lose and he's not a kind of man that really cares about uh, real people, real lives of people. He's living in some kind of historical books and in the world of his fantasies, as far as I can say. Thomas, uh, you've been on the ground there in Ukraine for uh, quite a bit of this time covering this conflict. Um, can you point maybe to some type of turning point that you've seen that sort of enabled one side, maybe Ukraine, to push back against Russia, or maybe that turning point has not arrived yet and will come soon. So, I mean, I should caveat this by saying, look, we will only be able to know the turning points, what they really were in three or four right. years once the conflict has simmered down. However, I honestly think that the major turning point was in about, in about the first three or four days when Ukraine maintained its unity, when there were no high-profile defections, when Zelensky stayed in Kiev and didn't leave, and when they were able to sort of push back that initial Russian approach on Kiev, I think that that really set the tone for the rest of the war, that for the rest of the war, the Russians were on the back foot. And had something different happened in those three or four days, it could have been, it could have been a very, very different story. So I'd say the turning point was actually pretty early on. Right. We certainly saw in Afghanistan, for instance, how critical those early days were when the country crumbled extremely quickly. Of course, it's a completely different situation in Ukraine. Orissa, um, to you also, do you identify any critical moment that you've seen so far in this conflict? Well, I partially agree with Thomas that the fact that Zelensky stayed in Kiev and led that defense of the capital so courageously, uh, you know, both rhetorically and leading the nation of resistance, it's key. But also, let's remember the uh, destruction of Ukrainian, of Russian, sorry, Moskva, the missiles in the Black Sea that in a way impeded Russian operation in the Black Sea and still uh, poses a problem for Russia if they indeed set that ambition on capturing the whole of the Black Sea coast. That was an important moment, an important naval victory for Ukraine. Right, Evgeny, any uh, final words there? Well, I agree with uh, <laughs> everything said uh, above, but I can add that another turning point was uh, the revelation of what happened in Bucha and Irpeng and uh, in uh, Kiev suburbs, because uh, this uh, united the world, I guess, even more than the start of this uh, uh, aggression, because what people saw were these uh, crimes and uh, dead bodies and uh, this disaster. Uh, changed the world's attitude and that was a second breaking point i believe after this uh, not very uh, efficient beginning of this special operation for putin thomas orisia and evgeny as we continue on the same subject the russian invasion of ukraine but taking a look at a different angle the angle of the sanctions as the european countries convene and try to agree on an oil ban from russia but is europe winning the sanctions war where is this all going let's take a look and hear from some of the european leaders today if some countries have legitimate concerns, let's take into account those legitimate concerns. I see that there is a political will, but when some countries are afraid of their security of supply, we need to find solutions. The unity should be maintained in the European Council, as we have done up to now, so that's important to continue. I think we're moving towards an agreement on a sixth sanctions package. Well, I have just got the text now and there is no agreement, of course. Of course, we're going to have discussions, but everybody needs to be on board, and so far, they're not. And again, you have 30 seconds for your opening statements regarding this issue. Is Europe winning or losing, or the international community also winning or losing the sanctions angle or war versus Russia? Thomas, what do you think? 
So it has been interesting to see that despite the sort of unprecedented international condemnation and sanctions, the Russian economy has not imploded in the way that people have expected. The ruble has bounced back to, you know, a fairly healthy level. Now, we don't know if the Russian state is sort of artificially propping it, this up, which it might be. But so far, I'm not entirely sure sanctions have had the desired effect, which is to cut off basically all supplies of cash and material to the right. Russian war machine that's devastating Ukraine. Orisia? I think the collective West, those who impose sanctions, has clearly won the first battle in this because how swiftly it was imposed and especially sanctioned freezing of Russian central bank assets. The sanctions are here to limit Russia's capacity to rearm, to impose these export controls and eventually in the long term uh, to deplete Russian economy for the, its resources to wage this aggressive foreign policy. Evgeny. Well, I was introduced as a playwright and a screenwriter, but I graduated higher school of economics and I have a managerial degree. So I believe that uh, these uh, European contradictions about uh, the six package of sanctions is something manageable. And uh, Russian economy is now still balancing because it has some supplies, but uh, Russia is running out of it and uh, the first serious crisis will strike in the middle of summer and the second one in autumn and that would be devastating. Right, so uh, going back to Thomas here, what uh, is sort of the main obstacle that you see at the moment between the different countries in the EU to reaching an agreement regarding a ban on Russian oil, which is at the forefront here, though gas, of course, is also an issue, uh, especially some of countries like Hungary, for instance, say they are completely dependent on Russian oil and they, they will not accept this ban. So uh, what else are you kind of seeing from afar as far as those conversations? Well, I mean, as I said, it's, it's difficult in Ukraine to keep entirely up to uh, abreast of what's going on with every country in Europe. One problem, of course, we do know is that the Hungarian government is the closest and most aligned with the Russian government on these sort of issues. And not only that, the countries like Germany haven't really kind of invested in a strategy, or at least they weren't doing it over the last couple of decades, to wean themselves off Russian and oil and gas. Mauricia, what do you think uh, regarding Hungary, for instance? you think that's going to be an obstacle? There are two supply routes of oil, especially to the European Union. One is by sea, another one is the by pipeline that is actually passing through Ukraine and Belarus. And this is the compromise that the intermediary step will be to ban the seaborne uh, oil, which will uh, eliminate 70% of Russian oil supply, but it will allow countries like Hungary, Slovakia, and Czech Republic to continue its supplies, and Germany as well. But I think it's important to understand that uh, in the in the midterm, the European Union will accelerate its independence from gas, from oil, and already coal. And let's not forget, Nord Stream 2 is something the Germans were insisting till the very last moment, and they had to absolutely freeze the project. And it's unlikely that will be uh, restarted anytime soon until this war uh, goes on. Evgeny, I want to ask you a bit about the uh, shipping also that's coming out of uh, Ukraine through the Black Sea that's been blockaded by Russia. This is also uh, other supplies, food supplies as well. We're hearing that Putin uh, may have reached some agreement with uh, President Erdogan of Turkey to kind of reopen some of those routes. Uh, who does that favor? Who is that good for? Uh, well, President Erdogan is a strong player in this situation because his, uh, first of all, he still has his negotiation position and doors open uh, to talk with Russia. And on the other hand, Erdogan is a, uh, Turkey is a part of uh, NATO. And uh, Erdogan has a strong uh, negotiation position about uh, including uh, Finland and Sweden into NATO. So I guess the one person and the one country who is winning in this situation is Turkey. But I don't think that uh, at the end of the day uh, this will all be in favor of Russia. The, well, there might be some kind of uh, bargain between Putin and Erdogan, and Putin can win something but not win the war. Thomas, uh, on the ground there in Ukraine, is anyone interested in all this 
kind of complex geopolitical talk, or they're just focused on surviving the ongoing war there? So partly it's surviving the ongoing war. Now, to the extent that the geopolitics outside reaches inside Ukraine, the vast majority of talk is just about weapons supplies. So it's quite common, for instance, to get a, you know, a basically a shopping list. If you talk to civ even civilians or let alone military commanders, they'll say, well, we want this particular weapon from the US. We want this particular weapon from the UK. We want these tanks from Poland or whatever. And I, I think they're far more focused on sort of day-to-day -day survival than the kind of geopolitics that's going on in the rest of the world. Wow, so the, 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 the right ordinary civilians you're saying to actually know specifically what type of weapons the army needs? Oh, yes, for sure. Also, remember, like Ukraine is on a total war footing. Almost everybody in here, I've spent a lot of my time, especially in the east, in like Kharkiv and the Donbass region, everybody here is involved in the war effort in some way. So there in sometimes isn't quite the distinction between military and civilian that there could be in other conflicts. Arisa, I want to uh, go over to you here. So the United States has lined up uh, 58 50, or over $54 billion in aid since the war began. Uh, we know that some of these Western countries and the United States are providing aid, providing weapons, which Thomas talked about as being important. But there's less clarity as to what the final settlement will be. So there seems to be consensus. There needs to be sanctions, weapons to Ukraine. But what will happen after that? Well, we are in a very dynamic situation where the impact of sanctions, you know, will uh, grind out Russia's capacity to fight this war, and then Ukrainians' uh, results on the battlefield will also lead to a different negotiating positions. And this is the calculus. The United States declares that Ukraine should be in the best position to negotiate, and that means losing as little Ukrainian territory and inflicting as much cost on uh, Russian armed forces as possible. And here significant is U.S. decision to supply multiple rocket launchers of a distance of 100 kilometers that could allow for some counteroffensive for Ukrainian armed forces to liberate some of the temporarily territories that they will lose. So U.S. is here in the land lease program, which let's remember was set up to fight the fascism. So symbolically, it communicates a lot uh, to Ukrainian population that U.S. is in the long haul with Ukraine until Ukraine wins. And it also boosts Ukraine's internal morale. If again, any final comments, we have less than one minute to go. Um, will the Ukrainians accept a territorial concession? Uh, I don't really think so. And maybe half a year ago, uh, in uh, Ukrainian society, as far as I know, there were some concerns uh, about, like, maybe maybe we can let it go or put it on hold or whatever. Some Ukrainians could say that. But now Putin made everything to unite Ukrainian nation and to make it totally unacceptable. Uh, so I don't think there is a compromise here.